um, we'll speak about we're able to solve. Um, what I'm hoping is that by the end of our two-part lecture today, you should be able to do three things. One is to generate a theoretical definition of friendship that's based on the psychological literature. And I hope that in doing that, you're able to see and acknowledge the many ways in which friendship differs from person to person. Um, and I'm hoping that you'll be able to discuss and evaluate methods of determining friendship quality. We'll talk about different methods and what each of them can and can't deliver to us, um, and really how that shapes our understanding of what friendship is. Um, and finally, I'd like you to be able to critically assess how friendship meanings and interactions are shaped by social and cultural influences. Um, we'll speak about culture, we'll speak about different social institutions, um, and I think it's also a moment to note that it, it is a bit weird to to talk about friendship in a meaningful way during a period of time when many of us are more isolated from our friends than we would have wanted to be. Um, and I'll reflect on some research uh, that speaks about that. Um, but I think, you know, it's, it's important to just acknowledge that this is, you know, it's been a difficult time for some friendships whilst other friendships have flourished under these conditions. Um, so let's start with an opening definition, right? I'm going to show you that I think friendship can be different things to different people, but what what kind of animal are we talking about when we talk about friendship? So for this, I'm actually going to go outside of psychology to the writings of C.S. Lewis. Now, um, if you if that name rings a bell, it's because you, like me, probably have uh, encountered uh, the books or the film adaptations of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And, this. and C.S. Lewis wrote um, that series of books, but he was also a very prolific author and essayist on matters around um, religion, humanism, uh, philosophy, etc., and he wrote a lovely little book um, called The Four Loves, An Exploration of the Nature of Love. And he wrote in this, something that I think is, uh, you know, really food for the soul. Friendship is unnecessary, like philosophy, like art, like the universe itself. It has no survival value. Rather, it is one of those things which give value to survival. Well, that makes me want to cry a little bit, actually. Um, he contrasted this form of love that friendship is with three other kinds of uh, love. And so, again, I think if we're thinking about, if we're looking to just define the scope of, of our uh, talk today, this is really helpful. So we've got friendship, which is this thing that seems superfluous, but really does give value to our lives, versus an affectionate love, um, uh, versus eros, which is lust. Um, and versus charity, a relationship that's, um, you know, valuable, but has a, a lack of reciprocity to it. And friendship may incorporate these things. I think in reality, of course, um, there's an overlap between friendship and these other three forms of love. But what he's saying is that this is, uh, friendship is a, a relationship in which one enters freely, in which um, there isn't the kind of biological compulsion, nor is there any kind of um, uh, other kind of compulsion or, or need to fulfill obligations to each other. It's something in which there's reciproc reciprocity and expression and mutual liking. Um, in this sense, it's really helpful between to distinguish between passionate love and companionate love. And I think that's one of the things that C.S. Lewis was approaching. And um, I'd argue in, in psychology research um, and in kind of lay depictions of psychology, we focus a lot on passionate love. Um, and we don't focus so much on companionate love, um, the love of people with whom we, we share our, uh, our days um, and our, our free time, but where there isn't that um, romantic element and there aren't the social institutions that uphold it. Um, and I think this is reflected in our culture, for example, that we have Valentine's Day, which is supposedly to celebrate passionate love. Um, and it's seen as a cultural priority, and in psychology, there's a research priority, and you know, we talk about attachment, how attachment may come through in adult relationships and such. But companionate love, not so much. Um, you know, there's that, that kind of uh, counter to Valentine's Day uh, that came out of Parks and Recreation, uh, Galentine's Day, um, and, and, you know, where you just spend the day kind of uh, appreciating your, your girlfriends or friends. Um, but that, you know, there aren't really any, like, that's not, I don't want to say it's not a real thing, but it's, that's a countercultural thing. And I think uh, within the context of that show, 
it was pointing out that actually we don't tend to celebrate friendship that way. But I would argue that um, for many of us, friendship is just as significant um, as romantic relationships. It may be preferable to romantic relationships and, um, you know, uh, partners may come and go, but hopefully your friends are there to pick up the pieces. Um, we just, we have a different kind of relationship with our friends. And if um, I would suggest that if we acknowledge family influences as important, um, workplace relationships as important, romantic relationships as important, why shouldn't we be giving a lot of attention to friendships when they are so important to our lives? Um, so what I'm going to start with, it, now that I've kind of brought you on side, I suppose, um, is let's start with some theories about how friendships are formed and maintained, okay? These are the kind of, um, the key theories in this area, and then we'll settle into things like the meanings of friendship and gender differences in friendship, etc. But let's take a look at traditional social psychological approaches to how friendships are formed and maintained. One of the key theories in this area is called social penetration theory. And this um, theory argues that friendships are formed through match and increasing self-disclosures. And there's a norm, a social norm, of reciprocity when people make disclosures. So if somebody says something very deep and meaningful about themselves, you are expected to match that with a confession as well. And that friendships form when these self-disclosures um, come through, right? And, and that's, that's the way it happens. Um, this theory is very popular and continues to be very popular, um, but one thing to note is that there are some cultural differences in disclosure. It can't be universal. In individualistic cultures, it is considered very um, meaningful and appropriate to disclose things about the self, whereas in more collectivist cultures, what uh, research has shown is that it's, it's not desirable to do that. There's the desire instead to hold um, hold information within the collectivist group, such as the family. And this, this method of uh, forming friendships doesn't seem to have that much applicability. There are also other additional critiques to this traditional theory. One is that actually we do have individual differences in our closest preferences. Um, while this theory maybe seems to suggest that having full disclosure and knowledge of the other person is um, what's preferred. In actuality, people have different preferences about how much they want to be close to other people and perhaps um, who they want to be close with. And that's really important. Um, we also find that disclosure differs between relationship partners so that rather than this actually being reciprocal to an equal level, as that theory uh, suggests, we find that you do have relationships um, where that's not equal or where between different relationships um, there are different levels of disclosure, right? which makes sense, doesn't it? Um, there's also research to suggest that interactions and strengths of emotional ties can vary by age. So rather than um, processes of friendship formation um, or friendship maintenance being something that is you know, universal, that emotional ties vary um, across different age groups, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, another key theory in this world is um, social exchange and equity theory, um, and uh, this wasn't developed by Crispin Turner, but they did a really good summary of it. Um, and this is an assessment of whether the value given equals uh, within a friendship equals the value received. So in some, there's kind of an ongoing cost-benefit analysis where you think, okay, am I, is this friendship valuable enough to me, right? What I'm giving, am I getting it back in return? Um, and this is thought about within the friendship, but also in comparison to alternative relationships. Um, so this seems, you know, that has kind of contractual elements to it. Um, and you see here, um, I, I've uh, included a, a cartoon from Calvin and Hobbes. Uh, Calvin, um, who, uh, whose best friend Hobbes is standing there as well. Uh, Calvin says, here Hobbes, I've drawn up a friendship contract for you to sign. A contract, says Hobbes. Right, it codifies the terms of our friendship. You can renegotiate in 20 years. And Hobbes shouts, people are friends because they want to be, not because they have to be. And Calvin says, that's what this fix is, with a big smile on his face. Hobbes says, if your friends are contractual, you don't have any. And I think that kind of sums up something about this theory. Um, it's a little bit Machiavellian, it's, it's a little bit Mean Girls, in that um, perhaps it does put a uh, very explicit value on certain friendship behaviors and um, suggests that there's an ongoing appraisal happening continually uh, within friendships. And potentially that is the case, um, uh, you know, but um, I think there, 
that that can be problematic. Um, so there's the expectation that in close relationships there should be equal exchanges of love and equal exchanges of instrumental, emotional, and financial support. Um, so again, this does have some uh, validity for sure, but as we continue through the, the lecture, perhaps you'll see some critical uh, points to be made with respect to this theory. Um, so what is it that we talk about then when we talk about friendships if we're not talking about a mutual... Um, and, and I suppose one, one thing I would say is that within that theory of friendship formation and maintenance, and again with the previous one of um, social penetration theory, if we look back to what Lewis was saying, C.S. Lewis was saying about the, um, the valence, the affectionate, uh, the beautiful part of friendship, I wonder if that can be captured by this um, by these theories, or whether this is what we might call necessary but insufficient, that it's a component of what's happening, but maybe not capturing everything there is. So I think in order to do that, we need to include a consideration of the meanings of friendship and the ways that um, we interact with our friends. Um, and in a fantastic review of friendship literature uh, from a developmental perspective, um, Hartford and Stevens wrote, the significance of friendship across the lifespan can be established only by establishing what children and adults believe to be the social meaning or essence of these relationships, as well as the social exchanges they actually have with their friends. So what they're saying here, um, and the article, which isn't terribly long, is worth, worth a good reading for, um, is that in order to understand friendship, you have to understand the meanings that people bring to these relationships. Um, this is called uh, what they call the latent meanings of um, friendship as well as the manifest meanings or the exchanges, the observable aspects of these friendships, right? So there's two prongs here. And that's what I'm going to kind of carry through the rest of this lecture, is ensuring that we cover the latent meanings and the manifest exchanges of friendship. And so now that I've kind of thrown a few ideas at you, um, I'd encourage you to think now about what makes a good friendship. And so for this, what I'd suggest is that you pause the video, you pause this lecture, put me on pause, um, if only people could do that in reality, and write down five qualities um, or interactions that you think makes a good friendship. And I would suggest that you put this in terms of your own, uh, your own views of friendship. Okay? Um, so have a thing, and then when you're ready, restart the video and we'll move on to the next slide. So this is a word cloud that extracts um, key descriptors of friendship qualities from the friendship literature. So I drew this up, it's not a systematic review or anything, but just to kind of get you thinking about the kinds of things that we think about um, that come up pretty reliably in the friendship literature when we try to describe what friendship is. Uh, one thing is intimacy, that friendships feel intimate to some degree. They have mutual affinity where the two people like each other and there's mutual liking. Um, there's a strong alliance, so a feeling that the person is there for you and is kind of on your team. A sense of caring, um, a sense of dependability, a sense of companionship, a sense of emotional closeness, of commitment to the relationship, a feeling understood of having a sense of benevolence, um, just kind of generosity. Um, and not all friendships will have these, and I think it's really interesting to think about um, when, when certain characteristics come up and when others do, and what what, if anything, do we think is, you know, is there one quality that really sums up friendship in and of itself? Um, so this is a, an interesting question to ask, and I think it's something for you to keep in mind as you look through the friendship literature um, in order to, to critically understand it. Um, and it's worth keeping these in mind because, of course, um, there's different ways in which, if we're doing friendship research, we might want to operationalize or measure friendship. And, and looking at this list, that's a whole lot of stuff to try to fit into one measure, right? So let's look at how people try to do it. And as I do this, maybe you can think about which one, uh, which method you think is the most sensible one. Um, and we'll look at both subjective and objective measures. So one objective measure to look at uh, friendship, and particularly to think about identifying a closer friendship, is a method of reciprocal nomination. And you may have, uh, you may recall this from developmental psychology now, because it's used a lot in schools-based research. Um, and what you find is that if, um, you know, for example, in, in a closed group, in a closed system, such as a school classroom, what you do is you ask uh, mostly children to nominate their closest friends. And you then compare the list amongst everybody to see, okay, well, Annabelle um, 
put Fatima as one of her best friends, and Fatima also put Annabelle, so they are mutually reciprocated, um, mutually uh, reciprocally nominated. Um, if Annabelle nominated Fatima, but Fatima did not nominate Annabelle, then there's a mismatch there. Um, and what you find is that reciprocal nomination is associated with higher levels of positive engagement and relational quality. Um, so it's one reasonably robust me method, maybe. But what we find actually is that in practice, asymmetry is common. Um, and so then that does raise a question about um, whether it is necessary for there to be symmetrical nomination. It's often driven by affect. Um, people give different answers depending on whether they're feeling happy or else. Um, the procedure means that some children are inevitably left without reciprocation. And that doesn't mean that they don't have close friends or that that friendship isn't close for them. Um, just because somebody else, I mean, goodness knows, you remember the like rankings in primary school about who's your best friend to change each week, etc., etc., etc. And you know, if, if Annabelle thinks that Fatima is her best friend, but Fatima has another best friend, that doesn't mean necessarily that there's um, some issues there. So it kind of narrows the concept of friendship and really relies on um, who's within the room as well. Um, and what evidence, uh, you know, what some researchers have suggested is that um, this procedure can make some groups wrongly appear friendless. And this it can reflect some systematic um, uh, uh, issues that, that can end up having impacts on how we view, um, how, what we normatively view friendships to be. Specifically, children from certain ethnic minority groups tend to look friendless using this procedure because often their closest friends may be outside of school. Um, and this is based on research that was done within the United States, particularly said that African-American children um, don't tend to have their closest relationships at school. And so using this, um, using this uh, technique may not capture um, the kinds of friendships that they have. So that's potentially an issue, isn't it? Um, other measures that can be used include subjective measures, uh, namely subjective self-report. And there is a measure called the friendship your friendship function questionnaire, which includes uh, self-report measures of a closest friendship along several dimensions, validation, intimacy, reliable alliance, emotional security, and stimulating companionship. And that's quite well used. I've used it myself. You see here a little uh, picture of some kittens in a box uh, saying that friends cheer, cheer us up when you're in your little box of sadness. Um, and so that's focusing more a lot about the meanings of these friendships. Um, and depending on what you're looking for might be more appropriate. Um, way of operationalizing, of measuring friendship. We can also think about issues in differentiating friendships. Um, and one measure that Bernd and McCandless put through um, uh, just asks people to rank different, uh, or to rank their friends across different dimensions. And um, you can try this at home if, if you like to, if you want to do this, um, pause, the, pause the video uh, to do it. Um, if we're all in a classroom together, I actually do ask people to do it, but not to peek at each other's paper. But if you think about your own uh, friendship group, friendship circle, try, have a go at putting people into these little boxes along the lines from stranger, strangers to the best of friends. You might progress from acquaintances uh, to other people being just friends, and other people being good friends, and other people being best or close friends. Um, and that can be really challenging. Again, you don't want to look at other people's papers because it um, hurt feelings. Um, but what the research shows is that this could be a very useful exercise, but also the boundaries between these different categories are really ambiguous and really fuzzy sometimes. Um, this obvious, it's obviously um, easier to see the difference between best close friends and just friends, but what tips somebody over the edge from a good friend to a best friend? It's a really interesting question. Um, other, and, and another kind of big question in friendship research, as well as you know, how are, you know, if we thought about the questions, how are they formed and maintained? How are they? Um, uh, you know, how do we measure them? Are questions around gender differences? Um, you know, that question asked by the classic movie when Harry met Sally, which I think still holds up after all this time. Um, is can you know can men and women be, women be friends? And also, are men and women different in their friendships? Um, so one really interesting study that looked at this is uh, from Thonley and Morocco uh, from 20, 2019. 
sorry, 2005. And they looked at the norms around friendship, right? So what are our social norms and gender-based expectations around how our friends should behave? Um, and this is based on research that suggested that women, um, and here I really am speaking about cisgender women and cisgender men because um, trans and non-binary identities are not captured in this literature, unfortunately. I suggest uh, you know that might be a direction for future research. Anyways, um, uh, women emphasize emotional uh, qualities of friendship, whereas the argument and research suggested that men emphasize frequency of contact or the length of duration of friendship. So this study aimed to look at the social norms and expectations of friendship and secondarily to understand whether or not there are observed gender differences in those social norms. They wanted to know kind of what, what there was, you know, do men and women really have different understandings of, um, of friendship and expectations around this. So they are looking at older adults aged 50 to 97, right, um, with a range of um, ethnicities and marital status in play. So they were asked, uh, the, the uh, participants were asked to rate whether or not, uh, or how appropriate a certain behavior was. And so I'll put these up on the screen, I'm not going to read them all. Um, but they are things like whether or not a friend kisses you on the cheek, whether or not they just show up at your house unexpectedly, um, whether or not they share confidence that you, uh, a secret that you told them. So interesting things, things that might come up with different people's functions. And they ran um, statistical analyses comparing people's expectations of what was appropriate or not. And so interestingly, the, the male participants were less likely to be offended if um, their friend told a secret. Um, women did uphold that as being more important. But men were more upset with women than, than women were about a surprise visit from a friend um, and for their friend not standing up to them for, for them their friend not standing up for them in a dispute. So the women significantly valued um, holding confidences and um, disclosing confidences. But interestingly, when you brought the friend's gender into, into it, those certain other things came into play. Um, men found it more significantly more inappropriate if their, if their male friend asked to stay over and if their male friend kissed them on the cheek. Which suggests, I don't know, what that, look, that looks to me like heteronormativity, but yeah. What do I know, right? Um, qualitative evidence with children exploring gender differences tells us some interesting things too. Um, one study by Rogers presents findings from focus groups with girls and focus groups with boys. And you do see again some of these gender differences coming into play. Girls um, believe that friends stick up for you when you're in trouble, although remember that the guys, that the men, value that as well. Um, when you're down, they cheer you up. They trust them not to leave you out or to tell you secrets. They're kind and generous. They share things, trust and respect you. Um, the boys had some, actually um, some similar things to say, right? So um, they talked about inclusion, otherwise you would be lonely. They talked about being bored, which the girls didn't. Um, and while they did talk about somebody being with you, they were more likely to refer to perhaps being in a fight. Um, but they also said they are there for you. They have, um, they're good listeners. So just based on this qualitative evidence, you can see some differences, in, uh, but actually some similarities in how children were conceptualizing friendships, which, when we put this all together, I think we can take some critical perspectives on this idea of gender differences in friendship, because there's a strong idea, I think, culturally, that men's, women's, men, that men's friendships and women's friendships are different, right? And maybe even that men's friendships don't matter, which is not what I believe, but culturally, I think it's a belief that's out there. Um, what the research in some suggests is that differences may be of a degree rather than kind, that men may emphasize certain things more than um, others, and women may emphasize certain things more than others, but um, they're, not, they're not interested in totally different things. Right? Both, both genders are interested in intimacy, and very closeness, and being able to trust secrets, that sort of thing. There also appear to be differences between manifest and latent meanings of friendships, behaviors, um, that when we look at meanings, we find those are fairly consistent, but the behavioral expressions of those do seem to have more gender differences. Right? Think about that adult study. Um, there were more gender differences, some gender differences there. Um, other researchers have suggested as well that gender analyses can obscure other variables, that there may be other things coming into play that have gendered components, but actually explain more about the differences uh, that we see um, between genders on um, their friendships. For example, Gillespie all suggests that people with children tend to have fewer friends than people without children. Um, and so depending on the, the uh, dynamics of, of um, 
you know, who's a parent and who isn't, um, you know, that can actually, that's, that can play more of an explanatory role. Um, and certainly in a developmental perspective, thinking about over time, that people may have more or less time for their friendships at various points in, in life. And certainly as a, a mother of a young child, I can say that my experience has been that it's very difficult to maintain your friendships uh, while you have a young, young child. It's not impossible, but it's, it's hard. And, um, you don't necessarily have the time for everybody that you want to make time for. Um, you can also, I think, pick out certain um, other cultural influences such as heterosexism, hypermasculinity, and a social homophobia of it being afraid of kissing um, that can infiltrate these social norms. And it's worth wondering whether or not they also infiltrate our research formulations. Um, and that can actually maybe look different than what you might think. So if we consider, if we think that a close friendship is one that maybe has a lot of physical affection, has a lot of intimacy and disclosures, um, that might be something that is more that you're more likely to find within women, um, in the UK anyway. Um, but does that make the long, the long-standing friendship of two men who maybe don't disclose everything but share a lot of their lives and share activities, does that make that a less close friendship? How are we defining closeness? So just lots of things to think about. Um, so this part one has gone a little bit over. You'll see that part two is a little bit shorter. Don't worry. Um, but for now, have a, have, you know, have a think about these and let's join together in part two for friendship.